fabulous, really enjoyed that. Um, our next speaker is going to bring us up to date now. So we started off several hundred years ago in Utopia and, uh, and Paul is going to bring us uh, into the steam age now, um, which is putting the art into STEM, the A for art into STEM to make steam. This is really, really important for us as a foundation because um, you know, we realise that making the world a safer place is not just about physical sciences and engineering. Um, it's about people, um, it's about human and social factors, um, and it's about design, making things safe by design. Um, and uh, along that thought line, we've been building a relationship uh, with the Royal College of Art in this area of design for safety. Um, this is all new territory for us, uh, and it's really exciting. So I'm going to introduce now Professor uh, Paul Anderson, who is the uh, Dean of the School of Design uh, at the Royal College of Art, the world's most influential, holy postgraduate institution of art and design. And, and if you haven't been there or been to some of their shows, please go, because um, it is truly spectacular. Um, uh, Professor Anderson has extensive experience in higher education uh, and joined the Glasgow School of Art in 1993, so that makes him more than 25 years old, um, and uh, was responsible for the creation of the digital design studio. It's very important, this digital uh, prefix in there. Um, and uh, has a personal leading international profile, as well as being the dean of the uh, School of Design at the RCA uh, as an international profile um, into uh, fundamental human computer interface issues um, associated with 3D interfaces, haptics, 3D sound, gesture-based interaction and supporting real-time 3D visualisation. So it is a really uh, interesting uh, field uh, to, for us to go into. Um, and uh, as Dean of the School of Design, um, Professor Anderson has driven the school's research-led approach uh, to design. And uh, we've been particularly working with the RCA um, in building this concept of design for safety uh, and particularly uh, looking at uh, innovations for risk reduction for safety uh, at sea and on rivers. So with that uh, introduction, I'd like to hand over to Paul. Richard, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk for a few moments uh, about the design for safety review that we've been conducting over the last uh, 12 months or so. It also gives me a great pleasure to introduce uh, in this process the two co-chairs who will also be speaking during this presentation, uh, Professor Rachel Cooper and uh, Chris Ross. I also want to say a warm thanks to a couple of my colleagues from the Royal College of Art in the audience, Professor Ashley Cooper and Dr Laura Ferrello. Uh, they have been working very closely with me and the co-chairs in developing uh, the whole foundation for this Design for Safety review. A little bit about the Royal uh, College. Richard has already explained that we are a wholly postgraduate institution. Uh, we've been around since about 1837. Uh, we're ranked number one for art and design in the world for the last four years running. And on the slide behind me, you will see in white uh, the number of courses that exist within the School of Design. Um, it's very, very interesting because we are attracting students from all over the world, approximately 65 countries. <clears throat> and at postgraduate level, we have 1,800 students studying these disciplines. And whilst we are producing some of the world leading designers for multiple industries, new business and government agencies, one of the key things about this is actually understanding not just design, but the implications of design and particularly how things are changing so rapidly. They're changing in complexity, in terms of different types of technology platform and also connectivity throughout the world. But one of the interesting things that we do is that we also teach people how to fail. 
Now, that's quite an unusual thing to do at an academic institution. But it's only when you understand failure and perhaps dramatic failure do you begin to understand and unveil a number of other issues. So designing something well is all very well, but you also actually have to understand the implications of what you're doing and how people will interact with objects, systems or the environment. Another fundamental approach to all of this is that understanding everyone's attitude to risk is different. And it differs from an individual level, uh, what scenario you're in, whether you're in the workplace or at home, or if you're working in a team, or indeed across a whole organisation. So that attitude to risk changes all the time. As the Royal College of Art uh, moves forward, it's currently building a new campus at Battersea South in London. Um, and for the first time, we will be building new research centres, some of which will be looking at new technologies such as intelligent mobility and autonomous vehicles, computing science, soft robotics, new material science, and of course, design for safety. So uh, I think it's fair to recognise that in terms of education and training, and understanding design itself, it's changed an awful lot. And we have a huge responsibility on our shoulders to start thinking about a new future, which is going to be very, very different in a relatively short timescale, i.e. the next five or 10 or 15 years. So the designers we're producing today really need to take account of all of that. So we need to produce different types of thinkers, multidisciplinary thinkers. In the process of conducting this design for safety review, we felt it very, very important to set up a series of symposia and to bring together a whole range of multidisciplinary thinkers from different industries and also at different scales and to start to pose a number of very, very basic questions. And further on in the presentation, you'll see some of the details of these results and outputs. And indeed, launching today is the first digital copy of the Foresight Review for Design for Safety. This was a very much an exploratory exercise. And um, before I go further, I just want to show some case studies that we unveiled just as food for thought at the symposium. And before I show you it, uh, I'm going to show you a video shortly of a piece of work that we've been working very closely with, with Lloyds, uh, and that's really looking at ship-to-ship, -ship, safe ship-to-ship -ship, uh, transfer, and also another project where we want to see the River Thames in London being the safest river by 2030. So the video I'm about to show is quite dramatic, um, but it's a whole series of quite complex failures uh, but working with our multidisciplinary master's students, we felt it very, very important that rather than design for something, we will de design with people. So the interaction with everyone involved uh, is very important. So this is a ship-to-ship -ship transfer going on. Now, thankfully, that's an unusual event but it does happen reasonably frequently uh, uh, over a period of time. And as you can see in the video very, very quickly, by the time uh, his mate grabs a life belt and attempts to throw it to him, he suddenly realises that the drifting participant in the sea is well far away and it's now impossible for him to throw that uh, and get there safely. This individual didn't come to uh, any harm, but it's a very, very clear indicator of what you would take as a routine um, problem uh, doing a ship-to-ship -ship transfer. The conditions are not that particularly difficult, but there are a number of things at fault. I think another few examples, again, just this is really food for thought to offer our participants. Just some examples, very, very simple to very, very extreme. Um, on the left-hand side, you will see a hairdryer, which was bought recently from an online retailer. Quite a standard product. We've had hairdryers uh, for years, uh, and upon using it for the first time, turned into be a handheld flamethrower. Um, very, very dramatic, and this also appeared on social media. So again, it's very, very interesting that both good and bad practice has been shared across networks, and particularly through social 
uh, media. And that's both good and bad, depending on who you are and how you look at it. On the right hand side, uh, you also see a failure of a major uh, um, manufacturer, in this case, uh, a tumble dryer. Um, and this manufacturer has had uh, major product recalls over a number of years. It's the same manufacturer that uh, also had a product failure in another type of white goods recently in the Grenfield Flats. So it's not just about complex environments or complex systems. It can be very, very simple products bought over the internet or a device that you would trust and use in common use uh, in your home environment. So this led us to start to propose a statement that would start to build uh, a philosophy and a foundation with which to debate and ask a whole variety of questions about design for safety. Again, uh, Rachel and um, Chris will expand upon that shortly. But the statement goes like this. We believe design for safety enables people and technology to operate safely. Design for safety is the actions taken to ensure that an item system or system of systems or network is free from adverse impacts on individuals, organisations, communities and environment, whether these happen as a result of implicit or explicit risks. So that was our starting point. And this led us to construct the following diagram to really analyse and understand the history, where we sit right now and where we're going to in the future. So again, on the, uh, the left-hand side, we're analysing and breaking down the problem into mature industries, industries with history. They've been around for a long time and they understood, broadly speaking, the technologies associated with that. And as we move across to the right-hand side into emerging industries, things begin to change. They become faster, they become more complex. And even governments, in many ways, are still behind in terms of developing rules and regulatory framework to control new types of technology and applications and interfaces. So as we go back and forth between the mature and emerging industries, a lot can happen. And the blue cross, if you like, can sometimes be very, very thin and understood, or it can be actually very, very wide and very, very deep. And this is where the issues begin to rise. And to break it all down, we decide to ask a very, very simple question. And behind that belies a huge amount of complexity. And we wanted to keep our discussions very, very simple to be fully engaged with a whole range of users. And we came up with the term, who would have thought? It's a term and a sentence we use in common use on a daily basis. Who would have thought that would have happened? Who would have thought that would have gone wrong? Who would have thought that that would have failed? And then asking that question in a very simple way begins to start to unravel perhaps a degree of complexity or indeed an attitude to personal risk or a team or an organisation. So to add more detail to the Foresight Review, it gives me a great pleasure now to introduce Rachel Cooper. Thanks, Rachel. Well, you all say, who would have thought? I bet you've all got examples of who would have thought. Let's go back to the mature industry of marine. So who would have thought that uh, uh, known and tested safety procedures um, and equipment have, would fail to save life? So this example is one that was reported by the Marine Accident Investigation Branch in 2016, where a British crew member um, uh, fell off um, uh, the, the, the clipper in the World Clipper Race went overboard because he was not tethered. Um, well, who would have thought? You know, who would have thought that the supervisor would not have ensured that the, the, the crew member was tethered? Um, but they wasn't, and, um, and that person lost their life. The following year, who would have thought that the equipment designed to keep people safe by tethering them to the webbing laterally around the, 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 the uh, um, edge of the, of the um, ve uh, vessel um, would, would fail. And it failed because it was designed to work on, on a longitudinal stress and not in a wave actually be damaged by uh, lateral stress. So it actually uh, uh, 
came apart and again another crew member lost their life so who would have thought that you can actually still have those sort of um, safety issues in a, a mature industry however we're now into a, the digital world where we live in both the digital and the physical environment and um, who would have thought i think we all think now that um, technology designed to improve our lives in our home um, to um, to but actually invades our home and provides opens up the whole domestic environment the internet of things where our um, echo talks to our kettle or our music or whatever who would have thought that that actually means that our house is spying on us and this uh, case study example that's in the report comes from a journalist called Matty Hill who uh, actually instrumentalized a whole house and and then looked at what was escaping and lots of data escapes who'd have thought that if you buy an internet of things kettle mind you who would have thought you'd buy an internet of things kettle but anyway who would have thought if you buy one the data actually escapes to iceland to a server in iceland so there's a lot of who would have thought in terms of our personal safety and i think we I've heard a lot about that in, in the recent press. So, and there's very little transparency about how these processes are working in our homes and the logic behind them, the logic of where the data is going and the exchanges between the data. So we do know that to live in a connected home, we perhaps are living in a home that spies on us. And then who would have thought though that a government could learn and listen from a community and engage with them to improve the resilience and their safety in, in, in terms of future major climate events. In this um, 2012 Hurricane Sandy revealed obviously the fragility of a New York and New York's critical infrastructure and how it copes with major climate events. Um, Obviously, in the aftermath of the hurricane, people lost their lives, homes and possessions, uh, power grids failed, etc. As a result of that, um, Pre President Obama's administration explored a sort of design strategy that would not only look at the physical interventions, but try to instill a culture of um, safety based collaboration between all the inclusive parties. So led by um, Henk uh, Ovink, um, uh, there was a, something called Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force, which actually its objective was to identify strategic interventions that could be co-created with all the parties. And this involved local communities, local governments, designers and experts. It was not just left to the perceived professionals and experts. It was all the communities. And the whole process was to engage everyone in the decision-making process to build and to design trust across both the communities and the experts, a belief and a trust of all those that they would deliver increasingly resilient systems um, against these sort of climate events. So who would have thought these are the issues and these are the things that we actually talked about with our experts. Who would have thought and where are the, the critical issues? <coughs> to sum that up, this is, the, you know, what is design for safety? Well, we are aware that design for safety is about this relationship between behaviours and culture, the, the, the issues of new technology and emerging risks coming from those new technologies. I'll give you one example. A lot of retailers now use social media and um, uh, build um, belief systems through ratings. So you go online and look at the rating of that product. Well, do we know the, um, where these ratings came from? Who are you doing? We're actually trusting each other in terms of our ratings. So this is a whole new area of um, understanding belief systems using social networks. So we're, st we, we're aware that new technology creates emerging risks. In that situation, we are trusting systems, but we don't know the, the sort of um, where these systems are built and who's building these systems. 
We also understand that there are, because of that, unexpected situations result in unexpected outcomes. How we behave as a result of um, that sort of in, in, uh, interaction with social media. And of course, as products, services and systems are integrated and we live in both the physical and digital world, the complexity introduces increased risk. We have also noticed that strategic thinking, strategic design approaches helps us understand that bigger picture. As part of the, um, the foresight review, we um, surveyed six industrial sectors, consumer products, food products, medical products, transportation technology, uh, uh, infrastructure and manufacturing te um, technology. And it isn't surprising that we had very different results across those sectors. Um, there was not, there's obviously a common view that safety is important um, and from all the experts, but there was a big gap between the understanding of new technology in that sector and safe behavior. There was a, 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 an increased understanding that the, the need to understand design for safety across the life cycle of the products and systems. Um, there were big, big differences between how you approach design for safety across those sectors, and there was quite a lot of difficulty in the respondents in terms of their understanding of that complexity and the scale of complexity. Um, one of the issues was there was um, a lack of clear knowledge and understanding of what the core principles and, um, and the ethics of how you do design for safety. What is the ethics in terms of how you, you understand how people behave, how you follow them, how you study them, and how you get them involved in the process of designing their products, systems, and services. Uh, so what are the challenges for this sector? It's clear that it's a very big task. Design for safety means we have to understand um, the bigger picture. We know that a lot of work has been done. We know there's a work across different sectors, um, but we need to have a clearer, coherent picture of these practices. We need to understand what are the best methods across the sectors. Um, there's a, a a lack of common understanding of the applied methods, design for safety methods, or a, a clear strategic framework. Um, do we have design ethics and principles in place? Um, I don't think we do. There are no guidelines in, in, across all sectors. Um, we need to have more open and collaborative relationships between all the stakeholders to share um, our knowledge and, and collaborate. Um, and how do we think about design for safety in the future? Um, how do we um, uh, enhance the ability of interdisciplinary collaboration, not just between designers and, and, and professionals, but designers at both strategic and government levels? Um, and are we ready to solve some of those top safety issues from a design perspective? There are... Um, some tried and tested methods, but we have to make sure they're um, flexible and we have to develop new ones because of the new emerging issues. So, where are the opportunities going forward from this report? Um, we need to look at design for safety in terms of human behavior. The behavioral insights that we've talked about before we need to embed a better understanding of human behavior, cultural and emotional states in, the term, in terms of designing products and services and systems. We need to understand how people work in this space between the digital space, the release of their own data and the use of products and services. We need to understand how we share design for safety practices across sectors and across institutions. Um, we need to look at um, an agreed uh, view of the design for safety methods that we can transfer from one industry to another. We need a clear set of principles and practices for um, design for safety. Um, 
and we actually need design for safety education and training. Um, as Paul said, there is going to be a design for safety uh, course at the Royal College of Art, but actually how can we embed design for safety in management education, in the education of um, engineers and architects and other professions? How can we embed design for safety in communities? And um, how can we uh, design and deliver new products that are in fact safer by design? And now I'd like to hand over to my colleague or my co-chair, Chris from Kinetic Maritime Safety, who's going to take us through some of those principles and practices. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to get on earlier because uh, I knew I'd be last with all the slides to, uh, to finish. So, slide. Um, during the, uh, the work we did in the, uh, in the various symposia, one of the most important things I think that came out was uh, a need to find these uh, unifying sort of principles uh, that would govern uh, design for safety work. And uh, it devolved into, into really two uh, sets of principles, an overarching set, which are on the screen there, and then to some operational principles, which are on the next slides. Uh, and very uh, strong focus came out from all the experts about principles, not necessarily rules, regulations, standards, codes, but principles. Uh, and there's the first of the overarching uh, principles deconstructed into its operational principles and a, a, a sort of simple application or translation at the, uh, uh, at the right hand side. I won't go through them all uh, uh, one by one. Uh, but uh, if, you, uh, if you look through them, uh, you'll see that consistent emphasis on a principled approach. And the uh, second set, so this is the overarching principle, is uh, design for safety actively reduces societal risk. Uh, some might call them utopian. Well, there's a bit of a theme there, isn't there? A utopian view. And as the, uh, the third overarching principle, design for safety, achieves the uh, objectives uh, through the principal delivery of its outputs. And there you can see the, the stages uh, there. Uh, I like the last one. Um, not even the CEO tells you what to write, even if he's paying the bill. It can be very, very difficult to stand up to that sort of pressure. But actually, uh, you know, it's one of the one of the real things that came out of our symposium work, which was uh, uh, very well delivered uh, under the aegis of the RCA. And there were a series of uh, high level recommendations came out of that. Uh, so it needs to be work to identify the future design for safety challenges across the various market sectors, uh, uh, as Rachel was describing, uh, develop uh, design for safety methods, and skills, because quite evidently, I think we found in, in some of the symposium work that people aren't using this principled and, and uh, high level uh, approach. And then, uh, of course, disseminate that. And to do that, you need to establish some sort of network which transcends countries and uh, uh, market sectors. Uh, and turning again, I, you know, I won't go through uh, every one of these seven uh, inputs from the, the foundation's uh, work, but you can, you can read those for yourself. It's very important, uh, I think, uh, and I really enjoyed participating in the, uh, in the work as a co-chair, that the foundation has provided through the, the mechanism of the RCA here, a, a really uh, tight mechanism to get people together from different sectors, different uh, uh, industrial uh, milieus, uh, mature industries like, uh, like myself, the marine industry, uh, the Internet of Things, you know, design uh, practice. Uh, we had guys from uh, the, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization talking about you know, how uh, uh, safe methods of bringing food 
uh, supply to, uh, to, the, to the world were going to be a challenge in the future. And pulling all that together and then synthesizing it and taking it to something that uh, matches uh, the foundation's objectives is very satisfying. And then to try and capture all this in a, in a diagram form, uh, we, uh, uh, we came up with this, uh, we call it the onion diagram. Uh, and I'll go through it in various stages and the, the diagram will build. Uh, so there you can see those principles surrounding uh, the, uh, the goals which will appear in the center. A culture, uh, a design for safety culture. Charles Haddon Cave QC talked very eloquently in the Nimrod report about the need to develop a safety culture. And I, I very much agree with that, uh, uh, with that uh, approach. But also a culture doesn't help you practice. So you need to add practice into that, uh, into that uh, work stream. And then you can see another red boundary has uh, uh, arisen here. And inside that is what we tend to think of as procedural safety, design for, for safety or for safe operation or safe use. So that's where our laws, our, our standards and our uh, uh, regulations sit within there. And in the middle is the goal of overall uh, coherent, safer design goals. And uh, uh, what we're calling there the design journey. And then uh, the um, gap between those two red lines is what we believe needs to be filled by actions that might come later in further working out the recommendations of the, of the report. Uh, that you'll be able to see. And that should be us. Am I on time? Fantastic. <laughs> you want some closing remarks, perhaps? Yes, well, I just wanted to say a very warm thanks uh, to Richard and Lloyds uh, for uh, um, allowing us to conduct this research. Um, it's been a very worthwhile exercise and I'm very happy to say we've engaged with multiple international uh, audiences, some of which are probably in this room as we speak. Um, and just again, I think uh, one very uh, worthy territory by pr uh, producing um, the opportunity to create a safer, a safer world and a safer environment. So thank you. Excellent. Oh, don't scoot off. Uh, we've <laughs> Thanks, Rachel, Chris and uh, Paul. We've got a few minutes. Has anybody got uh, any questions, sir? Yeah, John Rose from, from CHIRP. Um, I had the honour and pleasure working with the uh, transfer of the ladders with the, the RCA team. And uh, absolutely, uh, I mean, I've climbed a lot of ladders, you can tell by my grey hair, or white hair as is now. And to uh, be humbled by the innovation and the work they put forward in there was fantastic. So I hope the industry is brave enough to, to buy into those. Um, but who would have thought that we'd still sending uh, fishermen um, to their uh, early graves about once every six weeks around the UK coast? Uh, and, and so things like buoyancy aids and this type of thing have not been taken. And, and who would have thought that we're still killing people uh, operating uh, power-operated watertight doors? Um, and we need your help. You put your uh, toe in the water of the maritime world. We'd like to see you at uh, church. Sure, we'd certainly like to see you waist deep in it. Um, because things like watertight doors, uh, we've been going for 107 years on that one, on the safety design side of it and practical side for the seafarers. And in that time, we've managed to put a, a, a klaxon and a, a flashing light. Um, so we are pretty slow in the maritime world, and we welcome your participation and continue in that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That's very welcome. Thanks for your comments. Excellent. Uh, any more questions? Hi, Darren Gray from the Alan Turing Institute. Uh, I'm wondering with the design principles that you've been working through, if you've had uh, any thoughts on adapting uh, autonomous systems to include those design principles within their design? Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I think there are a number of technologies we need to think about very, very carefully. Uh, certainly in the centre, the Intelligent Mobility Design Centre at the RC, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at complete autonomous vehicles and other types of autonomous systems, uh, and also including soft robotics. And I think there are a number of quite big questions to answer 
uh, around safety. But I think one of the early uh, points of research that's clearly indicating, although um, there may be uh, accidents, as there always are in new technologies, such as an autonomous vehicle, for example, it is still, in many ways, still inherently sa uh, safer than a human being uh, getting behind the wheel of a vehicle. And that's really largely to do with a whole range of, of things where emotional, uh, physical computer and even your biorhythms will change on a day-to-day -day basis, never mind your experience and how you feel on any given day. So as a complete system, as a human system, there's huge variability. Even with uh, a lot of training, things can happen in real time. Whereas an autonomous system, unless there's something that's catastrophic that goes wrong, then there is a hell of a lot more reliability there. And I think we have to accept that uh, going forward. There's a huge debate raging as we speak uh, around things like robotics, artificial intelligence, and so on and so forth. But actually, in many ways, it's been around for a number of years. And I think we have to now own up to ourselves that what is actually safer in particular situations. Um, it's not necessarily we drive or operate uh, all types of different types of machinery because we think we can or we, uh, we think we can do a good job. So um, autonomous systems are very, very interesting uh, subject. And uh, particularly when you look at machine learning and artificial intelligence, there's huge benefits uh, yet to unfold. But unfortunately, through the media, we're suffering a little bit from uh, bad press and paranoia and the loss of jobs and what will we all be doing in five to ten years' time. But I think we'll be creating better opportunities uh, for everyone. Excellent. Uh, Rachel, Chris, Paul, thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.